Um, to start off, I have a question for all of you in the room. What kind of social contact do we all need to be healthy, to be happy, to learn well, and to live long lives? This is the question I'm asking in the Village Effect, just a very small question. Um, there's new evidence from the field of social neuroscience, which is a fairly new discipline, maybe about 15 years old at most, and it studies how our relationships affect our brains and bodies, and the reverse, how our brains and bodies affect our relationships. And the new evidence is telling us that our relationships have a really powerful impact on our thinking, our well-being, and yes, how long we live and how well we learn. Now, just as an example, the type of social contact you have influences, influences how well you can fight off infection, like the common cold. Um, that's research by Sheldon Cohn in Pittsburgh. It affects how fast tumors grow, not whether they're there in the first place, but whether they progress. There was this huge prospective study of nurses, uh, about 3,000 nurses that followed them over time. And those with breast cancer were found to have four times at the likelihood of survival if they had large in-person social networks. The lowest rate of dementia was found among people who had large circles of friends. So we're not just talking about colleagues um, or about other kinds of social networks that I'll get to into in a minute. We're, we're talking about the close friends and family that you see on a regular basis and the people that you see a little less often perhaps, the people in your community or your colleagues, the kind of networking that you're doing right here. That altogether is what I'm calling the village effect. It's a metaphor for the kind of social contact that we all need to learn well and to survive and to thrive. Now, just a few words about how I came to writing this book. Wherever mature adults gather, you may discover that women outnumber men about four to one. And that's because, as I discovered in my first book, The Sexual Paradox, which is about sex differences, all over the developed world, everywhere women do not still die in childbirth, women live longer lives than men, about five to seven years longer on average. So if you go to places like libraries or seniors tours or community events, you'll find far fewer men than women. And I, I wanted to know why that was. That's what started me on this journey. And a critical factor I discovered is that women have much more extensive and integrated social networks. They tend to prioritize and groom their relationships over their lifetimes. They often look for work that's social, for example, which is one reason why many teachers are still women. Okay? It used to be that that was one of the few professions that was open to women, but now when many women choose it purposely because it allows them to interact with people every day as part of their job. Now, um, this is not only a statistical fact, uh, but it's also true in my own family. Um, every, at the end of every workday, I actually come from a family of working women, and at the end of every workday, my grandmother picked up her black rotary model telephone. Um, and despite the intimacy of her conversations with her friends, she addressed, she had a list written in pencil of all the friends she would check up on every night, and she addressed them very formally as Mrs. D, Mrs. T, Mrs. S, Mrs. T, number two, etc. <laughs> and although this is not my mother, it could have been my mother, my mother carried on this tradition. We had a phone in the kitchen that had a nine foot long telephone cord, and she had it virtually glued to her ear as she moved around the kitchen, keeping up with friends and family in, you know, Canada has very long winters. So um, that was her way of grooming her social network when she couldn't get out as much as she really wanted to. So this is a family tradition, and I carried on except my network now looks like this. And let me just explain this to you a little bit. This is what's called a sociogram. So um, these are my relationships graphed out. Now let's see if I can get the pointer to work here. Does it work here? Let's see. 
If I can, I, I will, and if I can't, I won't. Oh, there we go. So the, if you look, the thick lines are strong relationships. The thin lines are weaker relationships. And remember this, that both are extremely important. Um, and the circles are females. The triangles are males. And you may notice that some of them are in bold. And the ones that are in bold are the people who are profiled in this book. If you get to know a writer, you'll realize you'll appear in their writing sooner or later. And um, so they're the sources of many of the fascinating stories that are in my um, book. Um, so as you can see, you know, this is how social network scientists graph out your relationships. So for example, what they might do in a conference like this is measure who's talking to whom, how frequently, how animated their conversation is, etc. Now, getting back to why I wrote this book, The Village Effect, about six years ago I was sitting in a dark auditorium, kind of like this one, and I learned an amazing fact. There is one place in the world where men live as long as women. It's a remote mountainous region in Europe, which is called the blue zone, where super longevity is common in both sexes, meaning people live long, long lives. And it's the only place in the world, although a couple are catching up, where men live as long as women. Let's see if I can show you a picture. Oh, no, it's not advancing. Stuck. How about this? There. So here's what it looks like. Um, and it's an, it's an island that's part of Italy. It's between Corsica and Tunisia. And in this blue zone, uh, a remote part of Sardinia, there are six times as many centenarians as on the Italian mainland, which is just about 100 miles away. Um, not even. And there are 10 times as many as in the UK or North America. So it's really extraordinary. It's the only place, although there is one Greek island that's catching up, where men live as long as women, which should interest some of the men in this room. And this piqued my curiosity, so I decided to go there to research the science of the place and to find out what it takes to live to be 100. Um, so let's meet some of these centenarians now. Maybe the battery is dead. What do you think? In the meantime, I'll use the computer. Um, this uh, fellow that you see on the left, his name is Pasquale Frascone, and um, he, in this picture, um, is about 105, but actually he lived to 110. And he also happened to be the uncle of one of the main researchers, um, whose name is Gianni Pez, who helped me discover the science of the area. He's one of Sardinian's super centenarians. He was born the year the diesel engine was invented. So that's 1893. And he died the year Facebook was founded. So that's 2004. So he lived 110 years and 125 days. He continued to get around and go hunting and even shot a wild boar at the age of 105. I didn't get to meet him because when I went to Sardinia, um, he had already un unfortunately left this world. But I heard that he was a very congenial man, fun to be with, active, always surrounded by friends and family. And that was, I discovered, the key. Everywhere I went, and you'll meet some of the centenarians that I interviewed there who are in the book, um, you know, I would arrive with my interpreter my daughter, who was traveling with me, she just uh, graduated from university and had had a CBC uh, fellowship and knew, really knew how to work the digital tape recorder and was at loose ends, so I invited her to come along with me. And I discovered that first, we could never get any clean tape. We were making a radio documentary because everywhere we arrived, it was the village effect. Every centenarian was surrounded by neighbors, children, nieces, nephews. Um, the priest, the baker, there was usually a crowd sitting there. And so it was actually quite difficult to get the kind of documentary sound that Rob has achieved in his film. Now, this fellow, um, whose name is Giovanni, in this picture he's 101, and he's um, with his 
niece above him who lives with him and his grandniece, the younger one, in the rectangular glasses. Now, if you look at his face, you can see that he puts a lie to the notion that you have to have a positive attitude to live a long life. <laughs> Yeah, he was pretty much one of the grumpiest people I've ever met. And I, I asked him, I said, Zio, which uncle in Italian, tell me, what do you think is your secret? Why do you think you've lived such a long life? And he said, nobody has to know my secrets. <laughs> I thought, wow, I, I, I've come like about 5,000 miles and you're not going to give me anything? Like nothing? And I said, you know, Maybe it's, I was trying to jolly him up a bit. Maybe it's the Cannonau. This is the dark red wine that they make in the region that's quite famous. And he said, yeah, I like wine maybe a little too much. Um, yet, even though I actually found him quite disagreeable, but <laughs> his niece up there who lived with him called him Il Tesoro, my treasure. And he was very precious to her. And she even kind of got annoyed with me when I asked, you know, how does it feel to to live with a shut-in. You can't get out, you can't see your friends, you can't do things. She said, you Westerners, you just don't get it, do you? This is a privilege for me. Um, everybody I met there, of any age, but especially the elders, was surrounded by a large circle of family, friends, and what we social scientists call the integrated social network, the people you connect with as you move through your day, uh, with whom they like to natter is one of uh, the expert said, and it was very different than the way you age in the United States or Canada, whereas George Burns, who was a comedian of my childhood, said, happiness is having a large, loving, close-knit family living in another city. <laughs> there, people stayed quite close to home. Even the scientists I interviewed there, they saw their mothers and fathers, if they were still alive, every Sunday, which was quite something for me. Um, and I discovered, not just through their amazing stories, but the research supports this. There's a, a study that just came out this March, so 2015. I mean, obviously too late for me to include in the book, but it showed that if you, if you satisfy three conditions, either you live alone, you feel lonely, or you rarely spend time with people, on average, your lifespan is reduced by 30% compared to people who are otherwise like you which is really quite shocking in our era of digital contact, I would say. It's something people very rarely think about. Let's meet another centenarian. Not all of them are as grumpy as this guy. Um, here you can see me with my daughter, Eva. And here we have Zio Giuseppe. He's 102 with his sons, Angelo and Domenico, in his kitchen. You can see it's kind of crowded, but there was also my interpreter and a few other people in there who are not in the picture. Now, he had, he did, you would see from his face, he did have a positive attitude. He loved telling stories. He loved being with people. And it was a huge difference between the glowering, silent Giovanni and this outgoing fellow, upbeat. And it confirms the research that is surprising probably to most people, that there is no one personality type that promotes a long life or longevity. Um, looking on the bright side of life makes life more pleasant, but it doesn't make you live longer. Um, it doesn't enhance your lifespan, which I think was a surprise to me and was a surprise to many people. So meeting these centenarians is just one of the, some of the stories I tell in this book, because the book is not just about health and lifespan, but is also about learning and parenting and all sorts of other issues. This lovely lady, um, Zia Teresa is, she really, she taught me a few recipes. She still cooks, which is amazing. She's 101. And their stories, including hers, help me understand the underpinning science, as well as a few little questions, important questions like, how long can I keep my marbles? And when am I going to die? And how can I put that day off? Um, and as you will see, the answer is not what we expect. You know, if you thought about what reduces your chances of dying the most, and I, I'd like you to sort of entertain those guests as quietly in your mind right now, um, you'd be surprised when you actually face the evidence. 
Um, the research was done by the same person, uh, Julianne Holt Lundstedt, who did the study that came out in 2015. And she measured every aspect of people's lifestyles that they could control. You can't control your genes, for example. You can't control your income for many of us. But what reduces your chances of things that you can control, what we call behavioral factors? So let's take a look at some of these, of these possible risk factors. The first and foremost, I thought, was exercise or being a couch potato. Um, breathing clean air. How's the air in Cambridge, by the way? Good? Versus breathing polluted air. Um, little drinking of alcohol, I mean, not water, versus heavy drinking, meaning lots. Um, having your hypertension, your high blood pressure addressed or treated versus untreated. Whether you smoke or not, or whether you smoke quite a lot, 15 cigarettes a day or more. Whether you have a lean physique or you're packing on a few extra pounds. Um, whether you have a full social life or whether you spend a lot of time by yourself or you're socially isolated. These are all factors that she measured. Whether you have high social support or low social support. What I mean by, and what she means by that is, social support are the people who bring you soup when you're not feeling well, okay? They're the people who lend you 100 pounds when you need it. They're your very close social contacts your parents, your best friend, your children, et cetera. Okay? That's what social support is. The people who are always there for you when you need them. As opposed to a social, an integrated social life are the people who fill in all the little spaces in your social life. So if you think of your social life as a jar, and you, the big rocks are the people who are really close to you, and then filling in all the little interstices are all the people you meet throughout your day. You know, the people you talk to when you walk your dog, the person that you buy your newspaper, or when you did buy a newspaper, talk to. Um, that's what I mean by a full social life. Whether you have cardiac rehab or where you have none. And so before I give you the results of these, think about what your guesses would be about what is the most predictive of people's health and longevity, although you probably have a pretty good idea. Um, here we have the bar graph with the most predictive on the top and the least predictive on the bottom. And I should really have started on the bottom, but anyway. Oh, good, I did. <laughs> Sorry, Naomi Klein. <laughs> I was just talking to somebody who, who I, I was talking to be another fam famous Canadian, Naomi Klein, who's written about environmental issues recently. So it's wonderful to breathe clean air, but it, compared to every, everything else that you can control, it's actually not that important. And interestingly, in the book, I profile a community, a religious community in the United States that lives in the most polluted area of the whole country. Um, most polluted water, most polluted air, because they're downstream from an aircraft, the aircraft industry outside of LA. But that's a side story. Next, whether you have your hypertension treated is next predictive. Your uh, body mass index, whether you're lean versus overweight. Um, sorry about the inappropriate term, it's just that, you know, you have to fit everything into those lines. <laughs> So when I put overweight, it didn't fit. <laughs> Cardiac rehab is next. So what's really interesting, and, and did you, by the way, manage to get the pointer to work? I'll have to point with my finger. Exercise, which I thought was paramount, right? Um, you know, I would try to make time every day for exercise. It is not even midway through the list, which fascinated me, because what the press usually reports is that it's more important than anything at all. It's pretty important for your mood, though. Um, whether you've had a flu vaccine is extremely important, more important than exercise. Who would have thunk it? Whether you were an alcoholic and you quit comes next. Whether you were a smoker and you quit comes next. Whether you smoke less than 15 cigarettes a day um, and that's kind of interesting, right near the top. And the top two are the qualities of your social life. 
your social integration, meaning all the small contacts that you meet, including people here at this conference, your colleagues, and those close people who mean so much to you. Okay? So that, those two are the most predictive of how long you will live. Okay? And just to give you an insight on how they do this research, they take a huge group of people. In this case, it was 39,000 people. They measure everything about them, and then they just sit tight and come back to them seven years later and see who's still standing and breathing. <laughs> That's how they do it. Now, that leads me to the next question. What kind of social contact? We talked about the social contact that you need to live a long, healthy life. What kind of social contact do you need to stay focused, to learn and to stay connected? Because not all relationships are created equal. And not all types of communication are the same. Um, when it comes to intimate connections, online networks can sometimes leave something to be desired. Okay. Um, yet we often confuse the two, especially when it comes to not only our elders, but our children. By the way, if you ever want to see the most hostile reaction to any criticism of digital activity, it's when you're facing a group of grandparents, because many of them only see their grandchildren via Skype. Right. So um, they're very fond of the application. But especially when it comes to our children, um, you know, when people found out I was writing about social networks, they all thought, oh yeah, that's really topical. They meant Facebook and Twitter and all sorts of other social networks. But they didn't understand that I was talking about the real social network. And you know, our, our love affair, as everybody who's involved in education here in the room knows, our love affair with all things digital has transformed the classroom experience in less than one generation. Um, and many students are now learning their basic skills from a screen. Which leaves me with the question, so of all the academic factors that we can control and yes, that we can measure, which of these factors best predicts academic success. And I'm going to look at a couple of studies. I can't look at them all. I think Rob Lowe in, 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 uh, on the website for relational schools quotes a meta-analysis of something like, I don't know, 59,000 studies, something like that. I can't remember. But other than genes, what are the predictors? Okay, um, Your peers, whether it's a single sex school, which I know is still popular in Canada, I imagine must still be popular here in the UK. The size of the classroom, access to classroom technology, which is, I would say, probably the biggest sales item for parents choosing schools today. The teacher skills, and I should have put the apostrophe on the other side of the S, sorry. <laughs> Family culture, the parents' earnings, okay. There might be, a, there, do we have any economists in the room here? There might be a few, I think. Um, and parents or their substitute, a mentor's engagement. Now, you would be, I think, surprised about one robust predictor of academic success other than genes. Um, what about parental engagement? Okay, we'll start with that. Or what we used to call, not that long ago, quality time. Okay? The quality of time that kids get from their parents, their teachers, their older siblings, and the important older people in their lives. Um, a lot of it looks like this. It says, and then Winnie the Pooh decided it was time to check daddy's email again. <laughs> now, I mean, Technology is a convenience, but it's not always the best route to learning. And in fact, I would say it hasn't been shown to be the best route to learning for very many populations because of the crucial role relationships play. Um, let's look at some predictors of academic success other than genes. We'll go through the same list again. How about access to technology? Okay? 
this is what the classroom looks like today. The line says, anyone following me on Twitter already knows what I did this past summer. But of course, the teachers in the room know that this exercise is actually not about what you did this past summer, but about communicating to a group of people. And um, a lot of that is now beside the point. So if the school's embrace of classroom technology is not the best predictor of classroom achievement, and I make a very strong point in the village effect that it is not, and I amass all the data, and there is a lot of data. But interestingly, given how much money is being thrown at this initiative, there isn't a lot of data to show that, it, that uh, technolo technology, whiteboards, laptops, tablets in the classroom, have any gains on the traditional classroom. Okay, most of the research after one year, two years, three years, five years shows, as, as I put it, um, the three, second three most important words in the human language, no significant differences. Okay, um, what about the quality of the teacher's communication skills? Um, the teacher's relationship with the students? Spoiler alert, I'm not going to give away um, Rob's film, um, but I will give away that top little uh, factoid that I alluded to that comes straight from Rob. I just cribbed it right from him. Uh, 52,000 studies, a meta-analysis showing that teacher quality was the most important factor in terms of educational outcomes. Um, and a study done by economists in the States did something similar to Rob, which is that they looked at educational data and looked for outliers, schools that were underperforming or in underperforming areas, and cherry-picked the teachers who were for some reason getting extraordinary results and looked at what happened if they could move them to a different classroom. And lo and behold, they had enormous impact just by moving them for one year. So after one year with a skilled teacher between, the eight, between grades three and eight, do I need to translate that for a UK audience? I know you call it form, right? So it's the third grade meaning about age eight to eighth grade, which would be probably about age 14, 13, 14, okay? So after one year, just one single year with a talented, devoted teacher, a teenager is less likely to become a parent, more likely to go to college, meaning university, more likely to go to a selective college, will earn $250,000 more as an adult over their lifetime, more likely to live in a good, safe neighborhood, and that's my favorite. Which teenager thinks about thinking, you know, saving for retirement? I'm sure there isn't one alive, but all this to say, teachers in the room, you are having an impact. You know, when your students retire, you are still having an impact. Now, not only have, has technology transformed the classroom, as you all know, it's transformed the child's home experience as well. So um, right now, the, the statistics are pretty shocking. First of all, unique to the UK, and the U not unique to the UK, but in the UK, most parents think that tech they buy lots of technology and smartphones, tablets, whatever they can get for their kids because they think it's good for them, okay? And it's good for their education. Um, right now, kids in the North America and UK spend more time with a screen than they do on any other activity except sleeping. So that's kind of interesting since they're supposed to be spending a lot of time in school, right? Um, and it means that a lot of their experience they gain not by looking face to face, not by picking up nonverbal cues, okay? Not by engaging with other people, but this way. <laughs> this says she thinks it's a touch screen. Now, now we don't, because this is still early in our experiment, we don't really know what the impact of this will be. Okay, we, we can't tell yet. It's too early. We don't have the outcome studies, really. Um, but right now, we do know that a child's playtime looks more like this than it does like this. 
Okay, I, I, this is actually a picture of me, age five, playing, learning how to play gin rummy with my maternal grandparents. And, and when I showed this, I, I did a, a joint presentation with my brother and he looked at the slide and he said something like, you have like way too many cards in your hand. <laughs> And, and that might explain the look of consternation on my face, right? It looks like I'm really, really concentrating. So the question is, is there any difference? Like, why distinguish? I mean, there are academics, and there are plenty of them out there who say that there's no difference. Why distinguish between face-to-face -face and digital activity? Just very quickly, because I want to leave enough time and energy for the film, when you com connect with somebody face-to-face, there's a whole cascade of neurotransmitters that are released. Oxytocin surges through your bloodstream. It tamps down stress, makes you feel good in the here and now, and protects you well into the future. It allows you to lower your guard. It allows you to trust more. And those people who've had to solve difficult problems know that the first thing you have to do when you're working with the team is have mutual trust. We know from experiments, many of which come from the Netherlands actually, is that a simple high five, handshake, pat on the back, even like a just little pat on the arm like this, releases oxytocin, lowering our cortisol levels, meaning lowering how our stress levels. Dopamine is generated just by communicating with somebody face to face in a room like this. And this gives us a little homegrown high. Um, all of this passes under our conscious radar, and yet, we all seem to conflate and confuse the effects of real interpersonal interaction with what happens over the screen. And just quickly, let's look at some of the emerging research. It's so new, it's not in the book, but um, I had to present it to you. This is research done by Elizabeth Redkay, who's now on the west coast of the United States, but was at Harvard. And she did an interesting study where she measured the brain activity via functional MRI of people who were interacting with her versus people who were watching a video, a canned kind of interaction on the same subject. Now anybody who's had an MRI knows that you can't fit two people into the scanning machine, right? You can only fit one. So it was quite clever. What she did is she was in the room or her research assistant and with a live feed they projected her onto the ceiling of the scanner and they could talk to each other through a mic and headphones and see each other and use their hands a little bit. And she found that different parts of your brain are activated when you have interactive type of communication versus when you have canned or like, in, in, you know, the type of communication that you can't really have an impact on. Now it's hard to read this slide, but essentially the darker orange means the areas of increased blood flow or oxygen uptake, meaning that those areas are more activated and they're all related to social cognition, attention, motivation, and reward. And sorry Elizabeth, I made my own slides because I didn't think yours were easy to read. So it, in particular, it affects the anterior cingulate gyrus, which is that purple band that you see in the middle of your, see this is like a slice down the middle of your brain, like if my brain were sliced like this and you'd be looking at it transversely from the side, okay? The amygdala is what controls fear, emotions, motivation when you have an approach avoidance conflict, it comes from your amygdala. And as well, I don't have my pointer, but no, that won't work. That little kind of stem on the bottom, right above it, the bulb there is the cerebellum and that monitors your movements and the movements of other people. That is also more activated, but I didn't include it here because it is not part of the limbic system. Other areas that are activated more when you're interacting in a live situation, the superior temporal sulcus, the temporal parietal junction, as you can see, they're sort of more in the back of your head around here. So this is kind of, especially in the right hemisphere. So we're starting right now to measure the fact that yes, there is a difference. Um, different things are happening in your brain, different things are happening in your bloodstream. And the brain is processing different types of cues in live situations. Psychologists call these cues honest signals. Um, we call them nonverbal communication, I guess. And I'll just run through them very quickly because otherwise um, it's boring to look at a text slide like this. Mimicry and synchrony, meaning how much you and the person you're talking to are mimicking each other. You know when you're talking to somebody and you're really 
into the conversation and they lean forward and you lean forward and they lean back and you lean back and they cross their arms and you cross their arms. This kind of mimicry and synchrony is part of what goes on very naturally to us when we communicate in person, but what is missing when you communicate through a screen. Your activity level, you know, how much you're moving your arms about, how much you're moving around, all this is very important, especially for a teacher. Um, how much influence you have. Influence means how much do you, is your volume of your voice and what you're doing and saying affecting the people around you. And that's something very important for teachers to be aware of. Um, and your consistency. Now this is something that um, researchers have shown predicts the leaders of a group. Like if you take a group like this and you just let them go with a glass of wine, they, researchers can measure who in a, eventually will take charge of various groups who will become the spokesperson. And that has to do with the consistency, the fluidity of their speech and movement, how much they're affecting other people, their confidence, their level of expertise as perceived by everybody else. Now, how do you capture these signals? Our brain does the best job of all, but there is also what's called um, a sociometer, which sort of looks like an iPhone and you can wear it around your neck. And um, Michael, you might want to check this out. The guy who does research on this is Ben Weber, and these sociometers measure all those nonverbal signals and can find out exactly and measure and crunch the data of what is happening in a group when they're just communicating with each other. Who's left outside? Who's including? Who's directing? And all of this is being used now in business because they're discovering that about 80% or more of Fortune 500 value is generated by these intangibles in social capital. So of course, when money's involved, people become more motivated to measure. So what happens if you are missing that? Or you can always get, instead of an iPhone that measures what's happening in a group, you can get an iPhone that tells you what to do, like a GPS for social interaction. And it'll tell you when to start talking, when to stop talking, when to make eye contact, when not to make contact, when you make a mistake, that's when it says recalculating. And we all know people who need something like this, right? The person who keeps going on and on about a very obscure topic that nobody else is interested in, doesn't pick up the cues that people say, now I have to move on. This is all comes from children learning by interacting with other children. So why distinguish between face-to-face -face and the digital aspect of communication? Besides the neurotransmitters and the hormones and the increased value it brings to a business or a group or um, the reduced stress, why bother? I mean, because there's no doubt that the digital world has great appeal. Anybody know what this is? Any guesses from the group? Somebody here has teenage kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are now spending in excess of 600 billion minutes a day online in the Western world, and it's increasing. But this is a very important message now because compared to one generation ago, compared to the mid-1980s, a quarter of us have nobody to talk to. When they do population surveys, um, in 1985, the number, the percentage of people who said they were isolated and had no one to talk to was 8%. And now it's 25%. So 40 years ago, we had three people we could lean on, those big pebbles in your jar. Now we have an average of less than two. Unless Unless you think these are all about, this is all about, you know, old gentlemen sitting on park benches throwing, you know, breadcrumbs to the pigeons. The UK statistics are really interesting about who are the loneliest in the population. The loneliest are people who are in their late teens to early 20s and people who are in the early stages of a retirement, so in their 60s, mid, you know, early to mid 60s. So it's a, what's a U-shaped function. It looks very, very different than loneliness looks like in Canada and the United States. And so if that's the case, I mean, why make a difference? Why pay attention to these data now? You know, and I think there, 
things that you can do, like gatherings like these. This is a, a conference I went to in Montana, and I just happened to take a picture. Um, simple acts like this can have a huge impact. Simple ways of communicating with students can have a huge impact. And when I saw that huge impact, when I discovered how powerful it was that people were living longer lives with their memories intact, okay, with more loyal and lasting relationships, and that this evidence was so fresh and so new, when I discovered the power of the evidence, I was kind of like Meg Ryan in that film when Harry met Sally, Sally you know? I, I, I kind of said to myself, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> there she is. And that dish is what I'm calling the village effect. Thank you.